excited about worship today and all that God is doing in our midst and at the wonderful ways that lives are being transformed week in and week out, month in and month out. And we pray today that you have nothing less than a Holy Ghost encounter with the Almighty Living God this morning. Uh, God is doing great things, and we are so excited today to introduce to you for the first time home our brand new worship leader who's off flank left today, stage left, and that is Micah Shelton and his beautiful bride, Hannah Shelton. I want to be clear, they're not both the worship leader, they're both worship leaders, but Micah's the worship leader, and Hannah's the little pharmacist or something like that. So we're excited about both of them being home. We love them, and we're excited about you and all that we know that God's going to do through you. I got emotional this week just talking with them about um, what, what God has on their hearts and the ways he's moving in them and the ways he's moving through them and the ways we will benefit from the blessing of God's presence in them and with us. So one more time, you just want to give thanks to God for this great moment. So you welcome them. Now I want to invite you to welcome each other. At the close of the worship service today, we will have in the cafe an opportunity for us to enjoy all kind of good home-cooked goodies, uh, cakes and cookies and punch and such. Uh, that uh, We're going to enjoy that fellowship at the close of the service today. So would you stand and would you greet at least three people you don't know? So you may have to go a little further so they're not right around you. Be sure to join us for a very special time right after worship today in the cafe. We'll be having a special reception to welcome Micah Shelton in as our brand new worship leader. Micah and his wife Hannah will be there, and you should be as well to welcome to Clear Branch. Don't forget, BBS is on its way and you can be a part of it. If your child needs to register, go ahead and do that on the website. Also, if you want to volunteer or donate, we're happy to take those. Just go to clearbranch.org slash events. Our Kentucky mission trip team is getting ready to go later on this summer, and you can help them out. They need your donations of paint supplies and different types of paint. Get more information over at Missions Corner this morning. All that's happening right here at Clear Branch. For more information, find us online, clearbranch.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram. Let's continue worship now. And thanks for joining us here at Clear Branch. Oh 
Good morning, church. I love this moment. I absolutely love this moment. I had the privilege of meeting this week with Dalton and Dakota. And they come as brother and sister, but they come as soon to be united as brother and sister in Christ. And uh, this uh, beautiful day is a very, very special day. In my office this week, we met and we talked and we shared. And you shared with me about asking Jesus into your heart as Lord and Savior. And so today I ask you in front of all these gathered here, do you profess Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior and put your whole trust in Him and Him alone for salvation? If so, say, I do. And is it your desire today to be baptized into the family of God, to make a public profession of your faith, and to tell the whole world, choose you this day whom you will serve? But as for me, as for Dalton, I'm going to serve the Lord. If so, say, I do. Then Dalton, it is my great honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Proud of you. Miss Dakota, come on. There you go. Amen. I got you. All the way down to the first step. There you go and sit right there. What a beautiful young lady. And today it is such a joy and an honor to ask you two of the most important questions of your life. One day you'll stand before a preacher and you'll say I do's of a different kind. But today you commit your life to Christ publicly in front of everyone. So I ask you, Miss Dakota, do you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and put your whole trust in Him and Him alone for salvation? If so, say, I do. I do. Amen. And Dakota, is it your desire today that by being baptized, you're telling the whole world that Jesus is my Lord and I will follow Him? Choose you this day whom you will serve, but I will follow Jesus. If so, say, I do. And Dakota, it is my great honor and privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All the way down. If you two will meet me at the front, and if uh, any others who are joining would meet me down at front, uh, that'll be wonderful in your nice wet clothes. That's perfect. It's okay, Mom and Dad, um, for them to be down here. And family, you're welcome to come with them as they come down front. Any others who are joining, feel free to come on now as well. Dakota, there you go. And Dalton and Hanukkah, great. Come on down. If you want to stand with her, okay. You're welcome to. Great, great. Mom and Daddy, come on, stand with your baby. Everyone, you're welcome to stand behind. There you go. But I want these, these three that are joining today to be right up in front, okay? So Hanukkah, there you go. Dalton and Dakota right there. There you go. Perfect. I ask you today. I love it. I love it. I ask you today two of the th- most important questions of your entire life. The first question, the two of you have made public today. And Hanukkah, you made public a long time ago. And that is, do you commit yourselves as followers of Jesus and commit that he is your Lord and Savior, putting your whole trust in him and him alone. This is joining the church universal. If so, say, we do. Was that you too? All right, good deal. All right, I'm making sure. We do it collectively, but we're doing it individually as well. And the second is this. Will you, with your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness, use those with us as we together build the family of God, share the kingdom of God, and further the cause of Christ. If so, say, I will. Amen. Family, do you receive them into our body today? I just want to offer a prayer over these newest members of our family. God, I thank you for Hanukkah, for Dalton, and for Dakota. I thank you for the public profession of faith that they have made this day. And I pray, O God, that you would help them to surely perform and keep the covenant which they have made to you. But God, I thank you that you will be faithful to the covenant you have made to them and to us. And so, God, I pray that you would use them in mighty ways to build your kingdom on earth 
and to further your cause around the globe. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. And all God's people said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you. You want to give glory to God one more time as we go back? What a fantastic way to be kicking off this service as we welcome new baptisms, as we welcome new joinings, as we get the opportunity to play a part in the lives of these people who have dedicated themselves to God. And just as we see this group who stands up here with them, we recognize that we collectively as a congregation stand with them as well, even if we're sitting down, right? Because we are joining our lives with theirs in the community of our God and how awesome that is. We just sang a song about how worthy God is, and He is so worthy because He does things like this, but also because He provides such abundant blessing. And He entrusts us with that blessing, with the hope and the expectation and the desire that we're going to do with it what He gives us the opportunity to do. He entrusts that we're going to share with people about our faith and our, our journey. He trusts that we're going to share the blessings that He provides so that others can be blessed. And so in this time of, of pads and offerings, I want to encourage you guys to consider exactly what it is that you're blessed with. Whether it's something financial, whether it's something that's talent, whether it's something that's an awesome, uh, an opportunity, whatever it may be, I want you to consider those things as you place your tithe and your offering in the baskets that are sitting on the inside rows. And I also want you to be certain to fill out those pads that are there as well. I know we ask you guys all the time to put your information there, but it's important. It's important for us to know who you are and how we can help you. I promise we're not going to sell that information off to somebody else. That's not what we're about. But we do want to make sure that you are finding the best possible ways to plug into this community. Maybe that you even have an interest in being somebody who's baptized or that you have an interest of, of joining the church. Whatever it may be, we want to be able to walk that journey with you as God walks it with us. So let's go to our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your abundance and we thank you for your blessing and we thank you for the opportunity to lift each other up and to love each other in that process. We thank you for the blessings you provide so that we may bless others. And we ask, Lord, that you will take a portion of that which we have, have that, that we give back to you and that you will utilize it, that you will multiply it, that you will make it uh, over and, and beyond anything that we could ever imagine so that our congregation and our church can continue to reach people of this community, can continue to reach people in this state, can continue to reach people in the country and even in the world as we consider those who've just come back from Peru. You know, we have an awesome chance uh, to be able to make a difference in lives. But we know, Lord, that you're the one who empowers that and that you call us to embody all that you give us, embody the nature of Christ as we seek to be his hands and his feet to this world. Bless us, O Lord, but not so that we can be blessed, instead so that we can bless others. In Christ's name we pray, amen. These altars are open. You guys come on down and share those prayers.
Good morning, church. I'm so excited about this new, brand new sermon series we begin today uh, called Recovering Holiness. Now, I'll just confess to you that some of you may have read that title and got a little intimidated. <laughs> Recovering Holiness, you're thinking, I never had it in the first place. How do I recover it again? Today, what I want to begin this sermon series in sharing with you is that our desire, our hope is to recover the image and the meaning of holiness, what it is what it's not. Jeremy will be preaching about next week. And today I'm going to be talking about the importance for us as we talk about recovering holiness, the importance 
for diving into God's word and experiencing God's image of what holiness is. And my hunch is that most of us have missed the point of what it is at all. And I'm going to share with you a couple things before I dive into the scripture today. And this is one of the cabinets from our children's new home. It, um, it was built in 1965, and this is not, these are not original cabinets, but they were put in many, many years ago. And they've been stripped, and they're taken back down to the bare wood, and we're in the process of redoing those. And let me just promise you, whenever you go through renovating, I have now become convinced it is far easier to simply build something new than it is to renovate. Amen? Amen? Yeah. And far easier. But let me just tell you, I'm so grateful that God didn't just do something new and give up on humanity. But he's about the restoring work of us. Can I just confess to you this morning, there would have been times in my life where it would have been far easier for God to say, I'm done with Vaughn. He's messed up too many times. He's too broken. He's done too many bad things. He's too messed up. It'd be just easier for me to call someone else or make someone else or do something else. But no, he has this annoying tendency to take the broken stuff of us and make something far more beautiful than we could have ever dreamed. Honey, let me give you this down here. We're going to dive into Ephesians 2 today as we open up. And I just want to encourage you to, to open your hearts. For those of you who are worshiping online with us, let me give you a challenge. And some of you, now you can't get on your phone and like text or anything like that in the room here, okay? But if you want to, po if you want to answer this question too, I want you to answer this question for those of you watching online with us. And hopefully the feed stays live the whole time this time. Uh, but our goal, our prayer uh, today is uh, that it would. But we want, we want to know what is the, uh, the most special thing you've ever stripped down and restored? What's the most special thing, whether it was a cabinet or a car, whether it was uh, a door or a house? What is the most special thing you've ever stripped down and restored it back to its, its original, maybe even better than its original beauty? So if you would answer that question for us, for those of you worshiping online, for those of you in the room, and for those of you online, I'm going to invite you to stand out of reverence for God's most precious and holy word. We're coming out of Paul's letter to the church of Ephesus in the second chapter of Ephesians. We're going to read verses 1 through 10. And I want you to hear this and receive this, this powerful image of, of God's image of holiness. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God. Somebody say, but God. But God. Oh, friends, but God. Being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ. Jesus placed us with Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages we might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, again, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of your works or my works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. You're on his refrigerator. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This, friends, is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks. You may be seated. Wow. Wow. There was a debate that took place many years ago. And the debate was between comparative religion professors. They were together for a conference and they were having a debate over what differentiated Christianity from every other world religion. 
And they were having many topics of discussion and wise people were saying wise things. And they were debating feverishly among each other. And one of them said, well, the difference clearly between Christianity and other world religions is that uh, Christianity uh, believes in the incarnation. That Christ put on flesh and walked among us. And one of the other world religion professors said, no, other world religions, other world religions talk about incarnation, that their, their God put on flesh and walked among us. That's not it. Some quickly uh, pushed back and said, well, maybe it's not about uh, incarnation. Maybe it's about resurrection, that Christ rose from the dead. After a little while, one of the other professors said, no. Other world religions talk about resurrection, the raising of a life from dead. The belief that death is not the final word, that's got to be it. Surely that's it. And the tomb was found empty and someone slowly said, no, it, other religions talk about resurrection. And then C.S. Lewis walked into the room and he had a big pile of papers that said that he walked into the room, had a big pile of papers and had his old tweed jacket on it, his long pipe in his mouth. And he was just kind of hustling into the class. He was getting ready, got there a few minutes before his lecture was to begin. And he heard the other professors dialoguing. And at this point, a heated debate had broken out about, well, what's different about Christianity than every other world religion? And C.S. Lewis said, uh, friends, it's, it's simple. Grace. Grace, that's what makes Christianity different than every other world religion. It's grace. It, yes, it's wonderful that Christ put on flesh and walked among us. And it's so powerful that Christ rose from the dead. Other world religions talk about these things. That the God figure comes to earth. The God figure is raised from the dead and overcomes the grave. But grace, that's what makes Christianity different than everything else. The room at that point fell silent and... Lewis continued and he said, Christianity uniquely claims God's love comes free of charge. No strings attached. No other religion makes this claim. After a moment, someone commented that Lewis had a point. Remember, Buddhists, for example, follow an eightfold path to enlightenment. It's not a free ride. Hindus believe in karma, that your actions continually affect the way the world will treat you. That there is nothing that comes to you that is not set in motion by your own actions. Someone else observed the Jewish code uh, of, of law implies that God has all these requirements to be able to get to the Father. And Islam's code of love does the same thing. At the end of the discussion, everyone concluded Lewis was right. Only Christianity dared to proclaim God's love is unconditional. An unconditional grace of God's love. That it's lived out, that love of God, that unconditional love is what we call grace. You see, God's love expressed in grace is unconditional, but experience it requires us to accept the gift and become a gift as a result. If I was out here drowning in Clear Branch Lake, and you came along and you threw me a life preserver, it was just an unmerited gift you just threw to me, it would be wonderful that it's there, but it only works if I reach out and take hold of it. It's a free gift that's offered, but I have to reach out and take hold of that. And then you can pull me to the side of the lake and I could be saved and sheltered. Sheltered, that is. The scripture today that we've highlighted is Paul's opening words that remind us, painfully remind us that without Christ, we are all on a collision course with a broken and meaningless life that leads to death. But let me tell you what. Jesus in his immense love that we call grace, saves us from something very profound. He saves us from sin and death. The immense grace and love of God saves us from sin and death. And I want to highlight this with just the first few verses of today's scripture. And you were dead in the trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we have all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. You see, those professors continued to dialogue. And one of them said, well, tell me this. If you know so much about God, Mr. Lewis, tell me what about this? If I light a match, I mean, what is, what is a flame and what is fire? If you're so wise, what is a flame and what is fire? 
that it's burning these things away. Well, puzzled, he, he said, we are told in a, it's a conversion of energy, that power and substance changing from one form to another. We know that it can serve mankind, but wrongly used, it can cause great destruction. Perhaps the action of fire, which worshipers of ancient times used to worship God itself, as a God itself, does reveal something of what God is in his marvelous power and continues to do so in so many ways. You see, the refining fire purifies or strips away. As we came and had to sand down the original cabinets and the things that were on there, and my mother-in-law has had this as one of her primary projects in the house for the kids. We do things for our kids that we would never do for ourselves. Amen? Amen. <laughs> you see, physicists tell us that no energy, nothing is ever lost. It merely changes from one thing to another. A, a solid changes to a liquid or a liquid to a gas. New growth and development is the reverse of that process. So many times what we find is that uh, we're, we're trying to work heaven into this flame, this, this fire that purifies and becomes holy by burning away. It strips away the things that are there that have covered up this image that was there all along. And it's a spirit in which we change from a body, uh, these bodies, and it says in Scripture that one day these mortal bodies will have to put on immortality. These physical bodies will have to put on spiritual bodies. That God is stripping away those things that are not of him and are not from him. You see, Christ, who is a perfect spiritual body, came and put on flesh in the incarnation. He put on flesh and walked among us so that we who are flesh could put on spiritual bodies and walk with him as well. To do so, God is constantly stripping away all those other things that have developed over the surface. If you go to the beach and you find that slime over the rocks or you find those barnacles that have attached, we've got to strip away those things that have, have colored it up and covered it up and have, have put all these other things that are not the original image that God intended. God is stripping away the brokenness and the pain and is using it to reveal his glory in even more profound ways. Let me be clear. When we accept Christ's redeeming work through his grace, we are saved from death and sin, but we are also saved to something. And this is the part I'm even more excited about by far in this message today. God is, God is saving us from death and sin and, and things apart from him. But it's not just, many of us just want fire insurance and we want to be one who accepts Christ so that we can have a, eternity in heaven with God so we can not go to hell. So we can be saved from sin. But God doesn't just save us from something. Maybe more profoundly, God saves us to something. Maybe God's saving work today is that he wants to save us to something. I, I read, a, I heard actually a wonderful message this week by one of my favorite American preachers, uh, Rick Warren at Saddleback out in California. And he, he was asked, he was in a debate and he was uh, in, in one of these discourses with other uh, theologians and, and, and political leaders. And they asked him, they said, uh, it, things had gotten heated up around um, pro-life issues. And they said, are you still pro-life after all these years and all your education and all those things? He said, I'm not just pro-life. He said, I'm whole life. And I totally agree with this. He said, I'm not just pro-life. He said, I'm whole life. I'm to the point where I don't just want to save unborn babies. He said, I don't want to just save them from death. He said, I want to save them to abundant life. I want to save them from a life without health care. I want to save them from and to a life where they are saved from neglect, that they are saved from people that would seek to hurt them. I want to save them from and protect them from abuse. I want to save them from all these other areas. You see, we're not just saved from death. We're saved to life. We're not just saved from sin. We're saved to holiness. God is saved, saved, saving us from for sure, but far more importantly today, I want to talk about what Christ has saved us for. That is life and holiness. Hear the scripture again today. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, even in that place where we didn't deserve his love, when we were broken and fallen and we continue to be, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him 
in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. It's God's gift to you. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. It's his grace. It's his unmerited favor. Not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship. Created in Christ Jesus for good, for good works. Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Friends, here's, here's what I want to say to you today. Can you imagine being brought from the last seat on the plane to first class. And you're not, it's not because you're a platinum gold medallion high level flyer. You just, all of a sudden someone comes up and, and brings you all the way up to the front seat in first class. That's what's going on here in this story. We are seated with Christ at the right hand of the Father that by his immense grace, he, he chooses to reach down and walk with us and, and love us and make a way for us. But God rich in mercy, full of love, overflowing with compassion, makes us alive with him through his grace. Some of us are really powerfully acquainted with mercy. Like you've done dumb things, I've done dumb things, and like someone let us off the hook for the dumb things we've done. And you've, you know, there's this difference between justice and mercy, mercy where you're not getting that which you really deserve, justice. And, and you've heard me talk so many times about the difference between mercy, not only that we get God's mercy to not get what we deserve, but we get God's grace to get his unmerited favor. This is, this is God's immeasurable love. You see, God, through Jesus, takes mercy a huge step forward with his loving grace. Ephesians 4, 6 again says this, But God, being rich in mercy and full of great love, and he has showed that love to us. That we are alive with him. A few years, a few years ago, an angry man uh, broke into the, the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam. And this week, again, I've, I've thought about what happened in Virginia this week. I thought about the painful brokenness of our world where people do horrible, horrible things. And they shoot people and they, they, out of their own difficulties or struggles or we still don't know all the details of what exactly is going on there. But I thought about this story a few years ago when an angry man rushed into the Rijks Museum in Amsterdam until he reached Rembrandt's famous painting, Night Watch. And then he took out a knife and he slashed the painting and he cut it to shreds before he could finally be stopped. A short time later, a distraught, hostile man slipped into St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome with a hammer and began to smash Michelangelo's beautiful sculpture, Pieta. The two cherished works of art were severely damaged. But what did the officials do? Did they just toss them out with the garbage? Well, they're messed up now. They're no, no use anymore. No, absolutely not. They used the best experts on planet Earth who worked with the utmost care and precision. And they made every effort to restore these treasures. You see, God does that with us. He sends the best of himself to us in Jesus. He sends the best of himself to come and, and put on flesh, to walk among us, to restore the image that he put in us. It, it's, it's as though someone has slashed our lives and they have chipped away at our lives. Maybe we ourselves have done things that have caused that harm. But God is restoring this image there's a wonderful story Stuart Holden tells of an old Scottish mansion close to where he had his little summer home. And the walls of one room were filled with sketches made by distinguished artists. The practice began after a pitcher of soda water was accidentally spilled on a freshly decorated wall and left an unsightly stain. At the time, a noted artist, Lord Landseer, was a great was a guest, that is, in the house. And one day when the family went out to the moors, he stayed behind. And with a few masterful strokes... With just a few masterful strokes of a piece of charcoal, that ugly spot became the outline of a beautiful waterfall that was bordered by trees and wildlife. And he turned that disfigured wall into one of his most precious and perfect works of art. You see, some of us feel like life has splashed on us, has messed up the image has put an unsightly stain or blight on our lives. And, and because of that, it's no longer worth anything or of any value. 
You see, we're saved by God through his immeasurable grace so that we might not boast. God takes what is worthless in the eyes of man and shows that it's precious in the heart of God. You see, God takes what is worthless in the eyes of man. You may have people that have told you, you've messed up too much. You've gone too far. You've done things that are too bad. You, are, you have this blight on your life. And no, you could never be of any value to anyone ever again. And God says, no, 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 no. With just a few strokes of his hand, he can weave all that broken stuff into one of the most beautiful stories ever. He can give you a ministry through the brokenness of your life that could never have been there before. He could take a few charcoal strokes and turn it into a gorgeous waterfall where his living water is constantly flowing over. You see, many of us feel like we're just not useful. We feel like we're too something. We're too old. We're too young. We're too immature. We're too broken. We're too uneducated or too country, too short or too tall, too messed up. But God... But God, rich in mercy, full of love, overflowing with grace, says, no, the story's not done because I'm not done painting. Get out of the way. Let me get to it. Let me work it in together. God, but God, let me promise you that God is not at all dismayed or disgusted by your struggles or failures. Nor is he caught off guard and surprised by your strengths or your successes. God has a way of using both the highs and the lows, both the darks and the lights, both the two this and two that. He has a way of using all of that to reveal his glory through your life. You see, God never called you to follow him to reveal how great you are anyway. I hope I'm not breaking your heart today. He never called me to reveal how great Vaughn is. He never called you to reveal how great you are. He called us. He called you watching online to reveal how great he is. God God calls stinky fishermen and shepherd boys and little girls. God calls old men and God calls old women. God calls us not in our own strength. But that through our weakness, his strength and glory can be revealed. There's a great story of a shining, beautiful kettle with a large capacity and a high price. It was made of copper. It was valuable in its ability to heat quickly. And being made of copper, it was a useful metal. Its alloys also gave it a gleam of gold. So it sat on the table of one merchant man and was prominently viewed in his store by many. Two of the disciples came to purchase the large, a large kettle and inquired of the merchant the price. And the merchant said, I would really like to sell you this kettle. But you see, I just can't. Because when it heats up, we'll, what you'll find is there's a hole in it that whatever's inside the kettle will begin to leak out. And though it's unnoticeable as it sits here in my store, I know what's happened over over and over and over. Every time someone buys it and takes it home, what they come back and tell me is that what they were trying to cook in the kettle all leaked out. The kettle won't hold water. I could have sold it so many times because it it looks so fine. But I know that every time the customer returned it with the same complaint, it has a hole and it leaks. It's broken and it's not useful. He said, the problem is because of the copper, it's too, too costly a material to just throw away. But because it has a hole, it seems it's no value at all. It is a real problem to me, the store owner said. Because I have, have over and over, I've had to explain the hidden flaw to my customers Finally, the disciples asked him, then why do you even bother keeping it? Why don't you just discard it or recycle it or do something else with it? And he said, I just can't bear the thought of parting with it. And finally, they, the disciples said, well, let us take it to Jesus. And the merchant man said, um, well, I heard he's just a carpenter from Nazareth. What in the world would he have to do uh, with something like this big kettle, this big uh, copper kettle? I mean, he's, he works with wood, right? He's a carpenter. He's, they said, oh, no, no, no. No, the Jesus we follow, he takes precious things and, and he, he's a refining fire. 
He takes precious metals and he heals them and he discerns where the weaknesses are and he's always ready to mend and to repair. He's ready to strip away and to refinish. He's, he's not done. He's at work in the most impossible situ- situations. Yes, we'll take it to Jesus and he can make it right. To which the merchant said, Gentlemen, I'm so glad you called. I'm so glad you came. You see, many of us feel like we started with a purpose in life. And we had these high hopes and dreams of what we could do in the world. And somewhere along the way, we felt like eh, life just went sideways. It went a direction we weren't prepared for. It went a, a direction that we didn't know how to respond to. We, we feel like it's too late for some reason. And you feel in whatever the two, whatever it is thing in your life, too old, too young, It reminds me of a song from my childhood that made me weep. Wayne Watson wrote this incredible song. And he, the song is the touch of the master's hand. And I'm not going to sing it today. But I want you to hear these words. And I want them just to wash over you because it is a profound song. The song came from the lyrics of a poem written by a woman named Myra Brooks Welch. Was battered and scarred, and the old auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. What am I bidding, good folks? He cried. Who will start the bidding for me? A dollar, a dollar, then two, only two, two dollars, and who'll make it three? Three dollars twice, going for three, but no. From the room far back, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening all the loose strings, he played a melody pure and so sweet, as sweet as caroling angels sing. The music ceased and the auctioneer, with a voice that was quiet and low, said, what am I bidding for the old violin? And he held it up with the bow. A thousand dollars, who'll make it two? Two thousand, and who'll make it three? Three thousand once, three thousand twice, and going and gone, said he. The people cheered, and some of them cried. We do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came, the reply was the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with life out of time and battered and scattered with sin is auctioned off cheap to the thoughtless crowd, much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, a game, and he travels on. He's going once and going twice and going and almost gone. But the master comes and the foolish crowd never quite understands the worth of a soul and the change that's wrought by the touch of the master's hands. You see, I think Mrs. Brooks got it. I think she understood. I think she understood what many of us fail to understand, and that is what happens when one life is transformed because it's been touched by the master's hands. Mrs. Brooks got it. The question is, do you? Has the master's hand touched you? Has the master's hand taken you that was dead in sin, dead in your brokenness, worthless and discarded by life? Has he begun to play his song through your story? Has he begun to touch your life and help people see that it's of great and precious worth? You see, the scripture today tells us that we are the workmanship. We are the prize and the joy of Jesus that we might walk in them and play them and sing them through our lives. You see, holiness really is not about a thing. It's about a person. It's about a person called Jesus who takes what was worthless and makes it priceless. It's about a person who takes what was stained and should be destroyed and says, no, I'm going to make it into something even more beautiful than it ever was. (laughs) I 
Has your life been touched by the master's hand? It goes on to say, if we have been touched by the master's hand and we are his workmanship, that we are called to do the good works which he has prepared for us in advance to do. As his masterpiece, is his story getting written through your life? Is his song being sung through your voice? Is his beauty being revealed through your brokenness? You see, the master's hand is a but God moment. It was just that. But God. <laughs> She's just but God. He, you know, he was but God. Have you had a but God moment? Have you had a but God moment that all of a sudden changed everything? But God, rich in mercy, full of grace, overflowing with love, seats us with Jesus. Let's pray. God, if we get real today, we have to confess that we feel like some of us have been beaten and bruised by life. We feel like we've been that canvas that was ripped, that sculpture that was chipped. We've been the wall that was stained. and We've wondered if it was worth anything at all. But God, do it again. But God, we ask that you would make us wholly yours. You would make us wholly committed to you. You would make us wholly your workmanship, your masterpiece. And that, God, we would do the works you've prepared for us to do. God, pick up the violin of our life. The world just calls it worth a dollar or two or three. But in your hands, oh my, but God... Oh, but God, I pray that as we sing this closing song, we'd, we would sing as people who know that but God has stepped in. God has butted in and changed our story. He's moved us from worthless to, to priceless. You've moved us, oh God, from discarded on the trash heap to lifted up on the mountaintop. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And God's people said, Amen. Through the sun sets free, always free.
I'm really grateful for the father's house doesn't need renovating <laughs> it's all put together by the master's hand and he's putting our lives together too you see these old cabinets are being redone and remade they're gonna look good because <laughs> God's still about the work of restoring He's about the work of making you a new creation. He's about touching our lives and using our lives in ways that should reveal His glory and His beauty. Today, as the service comes to a close, we've got an opportunity to, to greet and love on Micah and Hannah. And, and my wife turned to me after I sat down earlier. It's not Mrs. Shelton, it's Dr. Shelton. I'm so sorry, Hannah. Uh, my, my nursey nurse wife uh, made sure I caught that. Uh, it's Dr. Shelton. You married up, son. That's really good. That's really good. <laughs> We're so excited about starting this new series. And I hope you won't miss a Sunday. I know it's summertime, but God is doing great things in restoring us to the beautiful work that he would be able to say, that's my son. That's my son. That's my daughter. That's my son. That's my daughter. And he wants to do it in you and through you and with you for the works he created you to do. Let's go do it. God bless you as you go.